Hello, everyone. My name is Jen Braun, and I direct the AHA team training program. Welcome to today's sponsored webinar, Challenging the Status Quo for Improved Patient Outcomes. We're extremely honored to have Magnolia Medical Technology sponsor and lead this presentation and discussion today. They've been a really great partner for the AHA and appreciate their leadership and the work they've done in this important area. So before we get started, just a few rules of engagement to highlight. You can access audio by listening in through your computer speakers or through your phone. Uh, please note that you're in a listen-only mode. If you're having any audio issues, you should be able to access the toolbar at the bottom to switch to either phone audio or computer audio. Just know the webinar is being recorded and will be made available to everyone who's registered. Um, we'll note that and email everyone once it's available on our website. We also shared slides via email prior to this webinar. Please note that you received a slide deck from a previous webinar earlier this morning, so please disregard that one and refer to the one that was just sent out before we began here today. Uh, throughout the webinar, if you have any questions for our speaker, uh, please enter them into the Q&A pod, which you can find at the bottom of your screen in the Zoom toolbar. I'll do a moderated Q&A session at the end with our speaker. Um, and finally, when um, our webinar is over today, uh, we'll have an evaluation that will automatically pop up on your browser. So we really value your feedback. So please take a moment to complete that. So I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Carlene Marola, who is the Nursing Director of Critical Care and Emergency Services at Ascension Seton Williamson in Round Rock, Texas. So within her role, she oversees the leadership team um, of the ED, the medical intensive care unit and the surgical intensive care unit, the immediate care unit, the extended medical unit, the medical emergency response team, and many other special projects. So within, uh, with over 15 years of nursing experience, which ranges from bedside clinician in the ED to educator to nurse leader, she's been involved with many project implementations. And as an avid attendee of the Emergency Nurses Association Conference, Dr. Marola first found Steripath at um, the ENA Conference in 2019 in Austin. And so with a commitment to zero harm to the patients within her facility and an early adopter of innovative technology, she became the first user of Steripath with the Baylor Scott and White system in January of 2020. Her implementation led to a 94% decrease in blood culture contaminations within the ED and was later presented at ENA 2021. Um, additionally, Dr. Marola's leadership philosophy and strategies have resulted in measurable improvements related to staff engagement, patient experience, staff, turbin staff turnover and vacancy, along with quality metrics such as reduced hospital acquired infections. So very impressive. Can't wait to hear uh, more. So uh, Dr. Morola, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Jen. And thank you everybody for taking time today um, for us to talk a little bit about challenging the status quo to improve our patient outcomes. So we'll go ahead and just get started with a couple of housekeeping things. Um, I am being provided an honorarium from Magnolia Medical Technologies to participate in this webinar. And also you can check in your chat uh, function, the slide deck that we are gonna be using today was recently sent out um, in the chat. So if you wanna go ahead and open that, you'll be able to follow along as we go. So like Jen said, um, I have over 15 years of ER experience. I've worked in, you name it, I've probably done it. Uh, level ones and level two trauma centers, comprehensive and primary stroke centers, mental health screenings. I've worked in urban and suburban settings. And I've been lucky enough to have nine years of progressive um, leadership, whether it was a charge nurse, an educator, a supervisor, a manager, or a director, I've really had the opportunity to learn so many different things. Um, and that's why I think that I'm a, a good person to talk to you today about um, how we're going to challenge what we deal with every day. So now that you know a little bit about me, um, let's go ahead and little, learn a little bit about everybody else. You should have a poll question that's going to pop up on your screen. And just take a minute to tell us where you're coming from. What type of role are you in? Are you a physician, a bedside nurse? Do you work in administration, infection prevention? Go ahead and give that and give us some answers to those questions, um, and we'll see where everyone's coming from.
All right. So it looks like we've got a lot of people from uh, quality risk management, some infection preventionists, um, and some administration and leadership. Love to see some of the bedside clinicians in, on this, uh, as well as our multidisciplinary clinicians. It's always great to be involved at that bedside level. So uh, it's always important that we know what our roadmap is for the day. So just so you guys understand, at the end of this presentation, we're going to have identified the principles of what are called a high reliability organization, or you'll hear me refer to that as an HRO, and how you can use those to apply, whether it's in a hospital or another clinical setting, to optimize your patient outcomes. We're going to review some recent national movements about blood culture contaminations and how their goal is moving to less than 1% and what steps we need to take to make it to be able to achieve and sustain that reduction in uh, our collections. And lastly, we're going to discuss the importance of multidisciplinary teams, how we use a team-based approach, along with our evidence-based and best practice techniques and technologies to sustain improvement in our blood culture quality. So let's start off a little bit about high reliability organizations. We all want to provide safe, reliable, and effective care. So the Institute of Healthcare Improvement made the following statement. When it comes to patient safety, healthcare organizations have more work to do. Most healthcare organizations have implemented patient safety improvements by adopting standardized work of providing care, such as using checklists and other tools to reduce variation. Yet even these approaches can be limited as they don't by themselves achieve educational whole system safety nor do they embed safety into the organization's DNA. A more promising approach is to become a high reliability organization. So what is a high reliability organization? So the definition is, is that this is an organization that has maintained high levels of safety, quality, and efficiency over an extended period. And you say, well, we all try to do that. So what makes these organizations different? They develop ways of managing the unexpected better than other organizations. They prepare to address the growing complexities of operations in healthcare and the risk of significant consequences when fails, failures occur. So we're going to take a moment now to do another poll question. So I want you to think about your setting that you work in. We all have key performance indicators that we work through. What do you think is a realistic, appropriate goal that we should set when it comes to our key performance indicators in our environment? We'll go ahead and wait a few seconds to get our responses back. And just remember, there's no right or wrong answer. This is just your opinion. I'm just waiting to give some time for everybody to vote. Here come our results. So 95%, and I think when we, when I think about a lot of meetings that I sit in, um, I think we oftentimes set that goal at, at 95%. Um, kudos to the people that are striving for 100, striving for 99. Um, but we're gonna talk a little bit about why does 100% matter? So I want us to take a moment and think about some other industries. Um, we're gonna talk first about air traffic control. So airlines are the first organization that have really been identified as high, highly reliable organizations. So let's think about in the United States, every day there's about 45,000 flights that are handled by the FAA. If 99% was good enough for airlines, that means that there would be 450 crashes every day. And I don't know about you, but that's not something that we see. So they're doing it right. And then we pay, think about the Postal Service. They're delivering over 162 million pieces of first class mail. So if 99% was acceptable for them, they would lose over 1.6 million pieces of mail every day. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm waiting for a piece of mail, I feel like this might be happening. They might not be at 99%, but who knows? So let's turn to our healthcare industry. In surgical services, there's almost 137,000 major surgeries performed every day. If 99% was good enough, that means that we would have errors in a, over 1,370 surgeries each day. And I can tell you that if, if that was okay, I don't think I would want to have a surgery. So 
Even though it seems hard to reach, we have to try to get to 100 when it comes to healthcare. So how are we going to do that? Well, that's when we're going to turn to our other leaders and talk about these principles of these high reliability organizations. So there's five of them. Let's get started reviewing them. And we're going to review them as the time goes on. So the first one is preoccupation with failure. And you're going to say to me, Carlene, why would we want to be preoccupied with failure? It's not that we're saying failure is acceptable, but what we're doing is identifying processes that are not reliable and sustainable and monitoring their performance. So we look for those failure points. We program out those failure points, um, but we have to be willing to accept. Next is a reluctancy to simplify. So a lot of times we just wanna make it simple, but the reality is, is that sometimes those environments that we work in, they can't support simple processes. They sometimes have to be more complicated and therefore we have to support and practice continuous learning. Next, we look at sensitivity to operations. So this is where we focus on deviations from the expected and find those fail points. We have to look at all the possibilities. We need to have a, a commitment to resilience. Mm -hmm. Staff continually learn from their errors and near misses, and we share our successes, but we have to stay consistent and committed to making it possible. Lastly, we defer to the expertise. This is that portion where we assign the person who truly needs those skills, not the person that has the authority. So you'll hear a lot of times when we talk about processes, it's important to get hear the voice of the person doing the work. So when we put all of these together, we can strive to be a high reliability organization. But in addition to the organization, it's also important that we have leaders that are embedded in developing that culture. So how do we do that? Well, when we support our teams, the first thing is we have to listen to them. What they have to say, they're the ones doing the work, is most important. We need to connect that team to the big picture. They need to understand the why and see why we're doing everything. Next, and this one's hard. I'm the leader, I will say it's the first one. We're really good at setting clear expectations, but we have to reinforce that accountability. Expectations are only good with accountability. And if we don't hold ourselves accountable, we can't hold our staff accountable. Next, we need to follow up and ensure execution. This is being part of our huddles, being in touch and having your pulse on what's going on. And again, listening to your teams. This is my favorite, recognizing and celebrating. Yes, we're preoccupied with failure, but let me tell you, we are preoccupied with successes too. Celebration has to be part of your, your team. And last, we coach and develop. This is where we help our team find the way to do things on their own. No longer are the days where you're developing the processes, but you're engaging your team to develop the process. But also as a leader, we have to live those high reliability leader behaviors. We have to apply error prevention and techniques, adhere to best practice, and we have to be committed to rounding and daily huddles. These are the principle, these are the culture making pieces of a high reliability organization. So you might be asking yourself, Carly, why is this so important to you? Well, the truth is, is that a while back, I developed a why statement and my why statement goes beyond just my work, but here it is, I'm gonna share it with you. And I think you'll understand a little bit about why I love high reliability. So I'm a leader who cultivates relationships and actions to tackle challenges and make the impossible possible. I know there's a th few people on this call today that. I've worked with them in the past. And I think that they would say that this sums me up pretty good. I love challenges. And when someone tells me something's not possible, well, I'm determined to tell them that it is and figure out a way. So when I have that kind of mindset, I have to have the principles associated with it to be able to move forward. So let's talk about how I used these principles to address blood culture contaminations. For a little bit of background, we all have heard the word sepsis, especially seeing so many quality and IP individuals on this call today. Sepsis is the number one cause of death, readmissions, and increased cost in the US hospital system today. However, blood cultures are the gold standard test 
for bacteremia diagnosis, including sepsis. These blood cultures help us confirm the presence of microorganisms in the bloodstream. They identify the microbial etiology of that infection. They help us determine that source of infection. And then they provide us susceptibility testing to optimize our antimicrobial therapy. But you see, the problem is, is that blood cultures aren't 100%. So when we draw blood cultures, the truth is 92% of them come back negative, which you would say to me, Carleen, that's great. Well, you see, the problem is, is that 3% of those actually come back positive, but they're really not positive. When we look at those blood cultures, only 8% are actually positive. And that additional 3%, which is almost 40% of the total positive blood cultures are falsely positive. And that means if we have false positives, that almost half the time we're getting it wrong. Could you imagine misdiagnosing someone with cancer 50% of the time and that patient receiving chemotherapy unnecessarily? When we go back to our 99%, I mean, that would just be unacceptable. But yet false positives continue to happen day in and day out within our institutions. So these contaminations, what's the big deal? Well, we have about 1.4 million patients that are impacted by blood cultures, and a majority of these are treated with antibiotics. We all know that treating patients without an infection with antibiotics only leads to more antibiotic resistant and, uh, infections. So we're looking at creating potentially another 3 million people that could have antibiotic resistant infections. And furthermore, we might have 4,800 people die every year because of getting antibiotics that they don't need. Let's talk about the cost, right? Almost $6 billion is spent by healthcare systems each year on unnecessary treatments associated with false positive blood cultures. I don't know about you, but as a leader, I could do a whole lot with $6 billion. And one out of five of those patients that receives an antibiotic that they're not supposed to receive because of their false positive could potentially have an adverse drug event while they're receiving that in the hospital. So let's talk about one patient. That one patient that has that positive blood culture, that doctor needs to make a decision. Are they going to continue antibiotics or they're going to de-escalate? Well, if they continue because they think they have an infection, we now have unnecessary antibiotics. We have the potential for an acute kidney injury due to that exposure. We have the potential that that patient might develop an antibiotic resistant infection. We have the risk for C. diff because of that patient being exposed to antibiotics. They're obviously going to stay in the hospital a lot longer, and we're going to do more blood cultures, which is going to potentially cost us more money. There's also a study out of the University of Arkansas that showed that people who had contaminated blood cultures actually had a higher risk of mortality they were show, showed a 74% increase or almost double of that mortality. So we all, I mean, I can say, as long as I've been a nurse, I always remembered if you can get below 3%, you're doing a great job. But when we stop and think, is that really a good standard for patients? And then there's that cost again. So if we have a, an emergency room that does 833 blood cultures a month and 3% of them are contaminated, that's 25 a month. And you say, well, 25 a month, that's no big deal. Well, that turns out into 300 a year. And right now, the average cost for an incident of a patient being hospitalized, treated, antibiotics, everything associated with false positive is about $4,100. So that's for one facility, we're talking about $1.2 million. Again, I could do a ton of things with $1.2 million. But here's the issue. How many times have we heard, we just need to have better practice. We just need to train people. We just need to show them the right way. How many times have you heard, we just have to scrub the skin better? Well, here's the problem. When we collect blood cultures, there's both controllable factors and uncontrollable factors. So those controllable factors, we try to manage those the best we can. Reduce contamination when you're assembling your kits, prepping your skin, keeping your supplies together. But when we look on the right-hand side at that slide, you're seeing skin flora. And underneath that skin, you see all those yellow and green little 
little dots. Well, the problem is, is that 20% of our natural skin flora is actually below the keratin level of our skin. So even the very best skin prep can't get rid of that. And then what happens is, is when we enter that needle into the skin, we actually core that bacteria directly into that, that plug into our setup, and that could go into our, our blood culture bottle. This is a large portion of why we end up with contaminations despite best practices. So then why don't we just manually divert? We can take a, a waste tube and collect off a couple MLs and everything will be fine. Well, we love our evidence and evidence shows that even using a waste tube, you still, the lowest you can get is 2%. So then you say, well, I know how do we are going to solve the problem. We're going to have the only the phlebotomists are going to do the blood cultures. Well, this study out of Stanford showed that blood cultures collected solely by phlebotomists still were only able to achieve a 2.3% contamination rate. So we just talked about 2%. You say, well, Carlene, that's less than 3%. That's better. Well, you see in 2022, CLSI and CDC came back and said, maybe that's not the best standard. And they're now recommending that the standard is less than 1%. And I think given what we've seen today, that's probably the right standard for our patients. So we're gonna get there. How are we gonna get there? Let's use those principles that we talked about earlier. So just to recap, we have those five principles and we're gonna go into each one of them and I'm gonna to explain to you how I use these principles to design a process change in my hospital to address blood culture contamination. So first off, that preoccupation with failure. It, again, it's not that we wanna fail, it's just that we have to accept our failures and learn from them. So we're gonna ask ourselves, when changes are made, are, is there possible downstream effects considered? Are our near misses or our errors just brushed off and forgotten? I mean, I can tell you as a leader, I thought, well, I'm below 3%, I'm fine. I don't have to look at those errors. But the problem was is that we did try to impact that and we did everything we could. We tried training and education. Um, we didn't see any changes. And despite all of our efforts, we couldn't even get below 3%. We were still above 3%. So I had to keep looking for more options. Again, we, we tried to simplify the process. If we just teach them better, it'll be, it'll be, everything will work out. But in this case, we tried, and like I stated, we were still above 3%. I had to find something that was effective against both the controllable and the uncontrollable factors associated with blood culture contaminations. Because I asked myself, is what we're doing working? Well, the answer to that was no. What was the root cause of the problem? At that point, I didn't know because I didn't know enough about the process. And are there resources that were gonna help optimize this process? And that's where I kind of, I got lucky. So there's clinical practice guidelines out there that tell us that the ENA, so Emergency Nurses Association and the Infusion Nurses Society, which are two industry leaders in subject matter experts that they are recommending diversion of blood culture of blood in a blood culture collection as a best practice. ENA is saying 1.2 mLs, INS is saying 1.5. And like I said, CDC and CLSI, they both made a recommendation that we needed to change our standard and we needed to get to below 1%. And this is where I got lucky. I came across a product called SteriPath and I learned that it was the only clinically proven device to meet all of these evidence-based guidelines. And you're going to say to me, but it's just not possible, right? Well, this is why I learned that it was different. So this is the device as you see it on the screen. And this doesn't just engineer out the human factor, but also those uncontrollable factors that we talked about. So first, it comes pre-assembled um, and it's sterile. This, no longer do you have to worry about your nurses or your phlebotomists or your tech contaminating your setup. You don't have to worry about you know things touching one another. Everything is a closed system and it is completely ready to use. Next, you're going to see the active initial mechanism diversion and that user-controlled negative pressure diversion. 
So I, like I said earlier, I'm an emergency room nurse by, by background, and I don't know about how many of the rest of you, but I have to be in control of situations. So if I have a really sick patient, I can control this device slower. If I've got that big juicy vein, I can go a little faster. I, it's user controlled. So those nurse, that tech, that phlebotomist, depending on the presentation of their patient, they're able to control the pressure that that vein is uh, experiencing. Next, you're gonna see on the left with our little purple dots, that's our diversion chamber. It diverts 1.5 to 2 mLs of blood, which meets that recommendation from the ENA and um, from INS. And then next to that, you see a secondary blood flow um, pathway. So the reason that this is important is actually it prevents that diverted blood from mixing with your culture specimen. So what happens is as you engage this device, you siphon off that first mil and a half to two mLs of blood, and then you lock the device. Once you lock the device, you also lock that skin plug and the initial antimicrobial, the microorganisms in that collection chamber. And then what diverts directly into your blood culture bottle is clean specimen blood. So I was lucky that I started to um, test this and I'm gonna share with you some of my results, but I also wanna show you that there's a lot of other health systems out there that are using this device. So when we look at that green column to the right, that's their STERI path rate. And you can see all of these organizations, 17, and I know that this is, there's more than this now, we're below 1%. And many of them started way above 3%. You see one organization had 6.6%. .6%, um, so there was a lot of different um, variability in where people were starting. Um, but you see also in that blue column how much they reduced their blood culture contaminations. In the column with the little IV bags and the green stars, so those green stars are nationally peer-reviewed publications. And the ones with the IV bags, those are ones where they utilized IV starts at, during their trial. So we talked about sensitivity operations. So I had finally found a device that I thought was going to help our product, but now I had to figure out how to operationalize it. How do you know that I needed to know if the work was being done? And I needed to know where those possible failure points were and proactively mitigate them while being sensitive to every step of the process. So this is, we go back to those principles of being a leader. I had effective daily huddles and rounding every day. I had to constantly reinforce that safety measure and practice change and why we were doing it. I was also very lucky that Magnolia Technologies was on site shoulder to shoulder with our clinicians, teaching them how to use the product and making sure that they were comfortable. No matter what time of day, no matter what shift my staff worked, they had support. Next, I had to make it easy to use. We all know that process changes are hard. And if I don't make it easy, then it's not going to stick. So these devices, they couldn't be hidden in some supply room that people had to go and get. They needed to be at their fingertips and easy to obtain. So we made sure that they were right in every drawer that our blood, co that our collection, um, blood collections supplies were in. Next, I needed to be able to track utilization and compliance. So for this, I didn't have an EHR that would allow me to document that they used this device. So I didn't reinvent the wheel. This is actually something that I simplified. We bought little red dots from Office Depot or Office Max, and we taped them to the package of the device. If you drew the cultures with the SteriPath device, you took that red dot and you stuck it on the bottle. I was very lucky to have a multidisciplinary collaboration with my lab. And my lab would then receive the specimens and they would mark down on a paper if the specimen was collected with or without SteriPath. And the, I'm going to get into why it was important that we could do that. So next we went into commitment for commitment to resistance. This is where we had to respond when we failed. We had to look at those broken processes and make sure that if they were broken, we were fixing them and they couldn't be repeated. And we had to support a just culture practice and dialogue. 
So like I said earlier, we loved celebrating. If we went one day without blood culture contaminations, we celebrated. And if we had a day where we missed one, well, we dug into that and we had to understand why. So we had to make sure that that, heart, that process was hardwired for change. So like I said, pre-collection, we made sure things were easy to be done. During collection, we made sure that the staff was trained and, and competent. Post-collection, this was a huge important part. I was lucky that my lab was able to give me feedback within 24 to 48 hours. If that blood culture came back as a potential contamination, I knew immediately. So I didn't have to wait a month or two months to then go back to the nurse or the tech and say, you remember the time you drew this blood culture? Can you tell me what happened? I was able to do it real time and it was effective. And then I looked at that list, red dot or no red dot, because then that helped me understand, was it the product or was it the process? So if it didn't have a blood a red dot and I got a blood culture contamination, then I would go to that team member and re-educate them on the expectation. I had to be clear that that was our expectation. It was a non-negotiable. And if they did collect it with Steripath, then I had to see, did they understand how to use it? So we had an escalation plan. So if we had a contamination, our first step in our escalation plan was that you had to take a quiz. You had to look at best practices, answer the quiz appropriately. How long do you scrub the skin for? How do you assemble your devices? How long do you leave the tourniquet on? Just reminding them about best practices. Our second step in the escalation plan was that they were gonna to have to be observed by a champion to make sure they were collecting specimens correctly. And third, in support of our dust culture, we gave you three chances to get it right. It would have been a write-up for disciplinary action. But I'm so excited to say I never got past step one because my team knew how important this was to us because we didn't want to harm our patients. And this containing those errors effectively and really managing them allowed us to get long-term success. So let's get into that last uh, step. So that's the uh, different, uh, defer to the experts. So do we have the right stakeholders in place? Are the, right, are the end users part of the planning process? How does that process change or impact other departments? So we instilled a department where anyone could ask questions, anyone could provide feedback, and anyone could suggest new ideas. We were lucky that that was a culture of our department, but we had to listen to the input. So like I said, I was at huddles every day, reinforcing the why, learning from those, from those frontline leaders, those bedside clinicians, and then we learned from our hardwiring process. When I sat down with somebody that didn't collect it, I learned why. Maybe it was that that drawer was empty. Maybe it was that supply chain hadn't delivered it. So we had to be understanding and accepting of feedback. And we had transparent communication in creating that culture of an HRO. And I don't think that we really knew that we were doing it, but we now, I would say, that department really operates in these practices all the time. So I'm really excited to share my results. And I know this is a lot of reading is really tiny on the screen, but you can look at this in your slides. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and break down. This was the poster that I presented at um, ENA 2021. Um, and I was really excited to see a 94% reduction in our blood culture contamination rates. So we did a 90 day study initially. Um, and this was my initial study data. We started at a baseline of 3.62%, which you see in the light blue line on the left. And we started this in January of 2020. So what you see in the, the darker blue line, that's standard collection in the facility. And you can see while the ER, which is the orange line, was using Steripath, the blue line was everywhere else in the hospital using standard methodology. And you can see over that period of time, we climbed and we climbed fast up to 5.45% at one time. So in the month of January, we had one contamination um, and we did discover that it was because one of our nurses did not use Steripath. But then for February, March, and April, we had zero contaminations in the emergency department. Um, and I don't know how many of you know about the emergency department, but they are or at least ours and everyone I've ever worked in, they collect the highest number of blood cultures and they usually always have the highest rate. So from that 3.62 down to my 
average of 0.22 over my 90 day study, I got a 94% reduction. And I know what you're saying, Carlene, this data is two, three years old. Well, I don't know if anyone remembers what happened in March and April of 2022, of 2020, but this thing called COVID happened. And what happened was, is that while we still used Steripath, it didn't become our focus. We kind of lost sight and we did creep up a little bit because the reality was we were too focused on keeping our staff safe. But I was excited to say that after COVID calmed down, we reinforced our Steripath method. We continued to drive down our practices. And not only did we stay in the emergency room, but we sp spread hospital wide and we continued to maintain a hospital wide contamination rate between 1 and 1.8%. So you may have heard me say that that was where I was. And now I'm at a new hospital, I have a new team, and I'm going to have to have face a new change. My hospital is still impacted by blood culture contaminations where I am. But the truth is, is that the process that I used at my first facility may not work at my next facility. Sometimes my resources aren't the same. Sometimes the information availability isn't the same. But one thing that is the same is that I can continue to use those HRO, HRO principles to develop my new process. And even better, I can help teach others about HRO principles, philosophies, and culture, and help them in their processes of changing other things around the hospital. So currently, we are currently looking at this, um, but I do know that my same process isn't going to work again. And I, that's okay, because I know that we can make this change. And so some of you might be sitting here saying, this sounds really good, and I don't know where to start. Well, the truth is, is you're probably already using HRO principles and you just may not know it. So let's look at some of the tools associated with it. Has anybody ever heard of SBAR? I can guarantee you if you work in a hospital setting, you've heard this term before. Well, the truth is, is this comes from high reliability organization principles. That situation, background, assessment, and recommendation, I can tell you I used this continuously through my program. This is how I communicated change out to my team. This helped them understand why we were doing it, what the background was, what the findings were, and what we were doing. I used it then and I still use it now. Briefing and debriefing. We use this all the time, but when I implemented this change at my hospital, I used to brief my team at the beginning of the day during huddle, and I would huddle them together at the end of their shift and we would debrief. We'd talk about the challenges that we had. We, would set the stage for success at the beginning of the day. And if needed, we would pivot based on the feedback that we got. Some of these others, we can use ARCC, ask a, ask a question, request a change, voice a concern, and chain of command. Read back and repeat back. We use this all the time when it comes to critical lab values and things like that. 200% accountability. We have to be accountable. We talked about that in the beginning. It can't just be the expectations. There has to be accountability to go with it. And lastly, STAR. So stop, think, act, and review. This is something we use very often in safety events. Um, sometimes in other change managements, you might hear plan, do, check, act. Um, but these are the types of things that we have to use as our initial toolbox, but also our first steps into moving towards a high reliability organization. And as always, we have to keep learning and we have to keep improving. We know that problems do not stay solved permanently. Like I said, as the world turns, good processes process slow and become less effective. Like I said, the world turned and we hit COVID and our priorities changed. So you have to stay diligent if that's what's important. You have to review your processes periodically and still see if they still apply. You have to have available data sets that help tell us what could be coming. Use this as your leading indicator metrics. And the best practices make doing the right things easy while the wrong things hard to do. I made it easy for my staff to do the right thing because I wanted to support them taking care of patients to the best of their ability. So in summary, the goal is zero harm to patients. And the only way that we can do that, in my opinion, is to follow the examples of high reliability organizations. We need to establish clear lines of communication with our staff, accept the challenges that they're facing, and continuously seek ways to improve the process. I come, know this comes as no surprise, but change is hard. 
Empower yourself to be a champion of change. It's okay to challenge the status quo of how things are done in your hospital. Like I said, if you tell me that something's impossible, I'm gonna do everything I can to prove you wrong. And it's not a power thing. It's just that I know that that's what our patients deserve. And I challenge all of you to have that type of mindset when you're faced with your next challenge. So again, I really wanna thank Magnolia Medical Technologies for allowing me to speak with you today. If you have any questions um, or um, want more information about the products that I discussed today, please feel free um, to visit this um, website, give them a call or send them an email. Um, and I know that they will help you as much as they helped me. But at this time, um, I'm going to go ahead and open us up for some questions. And I would love to be able to share some more information if people have questions. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that presentation because you weaved in HROs and concepts of team training and specifically team steps so nicely into this quality improvement and outcomes-based presentation. So thank you for that. We definitely have some questions. So I'm going to kick things off with um, what uh, do you contribute to your high compliance with this change? I think that um, compliance, like I said, making it easy for them to use was, was a huge component, um, but it was a culture in our department that when we set a non-negotiable, it was that, it was a non-negotiable. Um, so expectations and accountability is important, and that needs to be something that's built into your culture. But in regards to this process, it was making it easy and having timely feedback. Those two components were key to us being successful um, in the implementation because the staff knew they were going to hear. Um, and then on top of that, celebration. Um, it's so fun to see that you have helped that staff member provide zero harm care to their patients. Um, that's what they want. They want us as leaders to remove barriers. So um, expectations and accountability, timely feedback ease of use and celebration. Yeah, I think I say we want to make the right thing the easy thing to do at least once a day. Yeah, <laughs> so I completely agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a lot of infection preventionists on, on the call here on the webinar. So what role can they play in helping their facilities reach the goal of less than 1% contamination rate? Yeah, I think they're a really important partner in um, these types of initiatives. Um, just like we're subject matters in what we do, their subject matters in what they do. So um, supporting uh, innovations like this and realizing that sometimes the traditional way of doing something like just scrubbing the skin longer isn't going to be the answer. Um, I'm actually at a different conference this week, and, and instead of saying no because... We need to learn to say yes and. Um, so I think as infection preventionists, help those leaders find new technologies like this and then cheerleader them to be able to implement them. And I think also being able to share those successes, um, whether that be within your facility or also if you work in a big system, sharing it at other facilities. Um, I'm a big supporter of what I like to call R&D and it's not research and development, it's rob and deploy rob ideas and deploy them elsewhere because we work way too hard in healthcare to try and reinvent the wheel all the time. It's time for us to just work together. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. We always say give generously and steal shamelessly. So <laughs> I'm, I'm completely on board with that. Um, so hospitals often use um, waste tube kits. So what are the difference between this and SteriPath? Right. So you have to remember is, is that there's still those human factors. You're still using traditional collection methods. So you still have that potential of contamination. And because there's not that, that true diversion uh, and lock off of the thing, as I said, there's that study that showed that even a di manual diversion or a waste tube um, is only effective at producing about a 2% um, contamination rate. So the thing is, is that there's still potentially that contaminant at the top of your vial. Um, as you remove that, that waste tube, you have the potential of contaminating because like we know when we collect our blood cultures, we're really good um, about cleaning the tops and leaving our alcohol wipes, but I've never seen anybody 
clean a waste tube. Um, so when we remove that waste tube, there's still the potential that we are depositing um, additional contaminants on the needle. So um, the evidence shows that it, we can only get to about 2%. So we obviously, through our studies with uh, the SteriPath device, are able to show a much lower rate. Excellent. Um, so what are or is the difference between phlebotomy and nurse draws? Yeah, so um, <laughs> I haven't done a lot of research on this, but I will tell you that, I mean, again, it goes back to being a subject matter experts. Nurses do a lot of things really well, um, but they are not the experts in drawing blood. Phlebotomists, that's all they do, and they are true experts. So we know nurses, they're constantly have other tasks, they have competing priorities, they're kind of in a hurry. Um, I'm a nurse, so I will say we are not always the best at following the rules or following best practices. Whereas phlebotomy, they have the time to, you know, scrub the skin for 30 seconds, wait 30 seconds. Um, so I definitely think that um, they are just subject matter experts, and we definitely want them to do that as all possible. But sometimes it's not possible. I mean, when I did this study, we didn't even have phlebotomy. Um, in our hospital at all. So we didn't have that option. Um, but if you have that, you can still see in the Stanford study that even phlebotomists still had a 2.3% contamination rate. So um, it's definitely not the best, but it's better than nursing. Yeah. And it's definitely going back to that deference to expertise mm -hmm. and really thinking about who is the best leader in the moment for this task or for this uh, mm -hmm. procedure or whatnot. And so, yeah, it definitely connects back in there as well. Yep. Um, so how many blood cultures did you collect overall in your 90 day study? Oh, um, it's a couple of years ago. Um, let me go back to actually my poster presentation. I want to say, I know what it is, but I don't want to tell a lie. So let me look. Um, so during our four month period, we collected 527 blood cultures. Um, and oh, no, that was with the standard method. So that was in the hospital, we did 448 blood cultures in the emergency room. Um, so we we were a little bit of a smaller emergency room, uh, we had an average daily census of about 65 to 70 patients a day, we were 118 bed hospital. Um, so we were definitely a community Based, but we were a trauma center, we were a stroke center, um, we were primary heart attacks. So we did have that busyness and we did have a low um, resource volume. So we didn't have techs in our emergency room at all. All we had was nurses. Um, so we did also take this study and replicate it in some of our other facilities that were larger. Um, and we did see similar results from them. Excellent. Thanks for, for bringing that back up. Yeah. Um, so when we think kind of collectively, so how do HROs promote a culture of safety and timely reporting of errors and strive for 100% um, while leaving such small room for errors? You know, I think the thing is, is that you're, there's always going to be errors. And, um, but if we, I don't know about you, but if you set the bar at 95, I'm pretty good if we get to 95. Um, I may not necessarily try to get to 96 or 97 or definitely may not try to get to 100. Um, so I think that it's like that thing where they say you shoot for the stars and land, you shoot for the moon and land amongst the stars. Um, you're not going to get 100% all the time. I mean, we did for three months. We got 100% zero contaminations, right? But if you don't set the goal high enough, you're never going to ach achieve it. So the thing that I kind of take away from the HRO principles, the biggest thing that I take away is you have to be willing to accept the error. You have to be willing to own the error. Mm -hmm. So if something happens, you have to take ownership. It can't be excuses. It can't be that's not my problem or, oh, it's only one. You have to take that error and look at it and understand it and try to fix your process so that it never happens again. It doesn't mean that it's never going to happen again, but you're going to be less likely that it's going to happen again. And as you start to hardwire those processes and you've addressed those pitfalls, you're going to get more and more effective in that culture of safety. And those one-time things are going to become less acceptable and your staff are going to do everything that they want 
to try to get to 100%. I mean, I don't know about any, uh, any other areas, but my critical care areas are super competitive. They want to be the best of the best. I mean, no one comes to work every day and says, I want to harm somebody. We want to take the best care possible. And it's our job as leaders to make sure that our processes, the products and resources that we're providing our staff with are helping them achieve that goal. We can't always give them all the staff in the world. We can't give them all the beds in the world, but we can make sure that our processes are effective and the resources that we do have are just as effective. You're going to have errors and that's okay. And you have to be able to accept that. But what you can't do is make excuses when errors happen. You know, I develop process maps. My new team is probably sick and tired of hearing me say, what's the process for that? But when I look at a process, I try to find every possible fail point and then program out those failures so that I make sure when I hand a process to my staff, it's as bulletproof as I can make it, or at least as I think. But most of the time, they're the ones that can poke the holes in it. And that's why it's important. And I always bring them in. Anytime we develop a process, it always goes to frontline for a review before it goes live, because chances are, if there's a Swiss cheese, they're going to find the hole in it um, and they have to be your partners. And what you get to when you deploy these over time is you eventually get to a point where you can give a team an objective and you can watch them develop their own process because because they've taught themselves. You've taught them how to do that, but your culture supports that and they know how to do it and they will be successful. And that is so much more rewarding than giving them a piece of paper and telling them what to do. Right. And kind of uh, what you just said, where you share the process with your frontline staff for them to review. Can you tell me more about that? Like how um, engaged are they the first time you show them this? Like, how do you get them involved other than, hey, can you review this process and make sure it looks good on your end? Yeah, Jen, that's a great question. So I think that the way to get them engaged is the first time you try to do that, find something that's really important to them, right? You have to have your pulse. Like for me, the, it sounds silly, but the first thing when I started as a new leader, the one thing that was super important to my staff was their hol holiday schedule, okay? And it's not clinical, but it's a process. Um, and it was important to them and they wanted it to be right. So I won them over by giving them control of something that was super important because if it was important to them, it was important to me. Um, so you have to know your audience. You have to know your team. Um, you, you have to be able to read them on their good days and on their bad days. Um, and I think that that strong culture that we had and the principles that we had deployed by the time COVID came really allowed us to pivot quickly as things happened um, and pull together and be really strong. I was super proud. While many facilities were losing people during COVID, um, we had no turnover. We lost not one single nurse out of our emergency room or our ICU or the respiratory unit um, during a time of complete devastation for many of us. Yeah, that's incredible. And yeah, I, I hear you um, Yeah, emphasizing the point that you're, you laid the groundwork for the culture of feedback and getting the frontline um, involved and having ownership by starting with something, you're right, that was non-clinical, that didn't have to do with patient outcomes, but was really important to them, which was their, their schedule and their holiday. And so mm -hmm. you're laying the expectation of we're in this together, we're going to, I want your feedback, I want you involved. Um, so that when you have um, quality improvement initiatives such as this, the expectation is there that they they do have that ownership in, in the process. Yeah. So that's great. Um, kind of along the same vein, like overall, how do you hold, this is a multi-part question, so I'll try and worry about that. So how do you hold staff accountable overall? You talk a lot about process, you talk about ownership, but does this turn into just educating the individual when they did not use SteriPath mm -hmm. or did this ever lead to disciplinary action? Right. So like I said, we developed a three a three tier um, process of escalation for when a, when a nurse had a contamination, whether that was a failure to use, use SteriPath or whether it was use and still having a failure. Um, and like I said, thankfully, we never got to that point of having to go past that first step of re-education. Mm -hmm. But for us, it was gonna be re-education, observation and recompetency, 
and then discipline because that to me was a just culture right we want to make sure that our staff we understand that like i said things are going to happen but we're going to own them and just like i'm going to own them as a leader they as a staff member are going to own them because that is a patient that could be your loved one that could be my loved one they need to understand that they're impacting someone's life but accountability in general um before i can hold anybody accountable i always need to stop pause and understand their why just like i want to under they want to understand why are we doing this right so i need to understand why were they why did they not meet the ex expectation why did they not do what they were expected to do you know and that's where i because i have to be open to that feedback if it's that they didn't use the product because well carly we were out of stock we didn't have any more left well, then that turns into I can't hold them accountable. I need to hold myself and my supply chain accountable. Um, so I think it's important as a leader to like what we like to call it is practice the pause. Um, we can't just jump to conclusions. We can't assume that we know what happened. Um, we have to just like we need to look at the big picture when it comes to it, a process change. We have to look at the big picture when it comes to that nurse, you know. If the nurse says to me, well, I didn't use Steripath because my patient was crashing in front of me and I was more concerned with drawing the blood and getting off so I could get meds. Well, you did the right thing. Like, again, I'm going to reiterate in all other situations, let's make sure that we follow that. But in that situation, I'm going to commend them for doing what was best for the patient at that point, even if it meant deviating from practice. Yeah, you sound like a very empath uh, empathetic leader. So uh, I try. <laughs> Um, I think we just have a couple minutes, so I'm going to end with this question. Um, so you may or may not have run into a few naysayers along the way who may have said, you know, it's unrealistic to get to this like lower contamination rate. So what would you say to them? Well, I think that we are at a point now that the evidence is out there. You know, the evidence is clear. And if we don't use data to champion our changes and utilize data to position ourselves well against naysayers, um, then it's not going to be effective, right? So I would say utilize the data that's out there, show them that these organizations can do it. And if we go back to that slide, I'll just hop back for a minute. You know, some of these organizations are very, very large organizations that are utilizing this and um, getting to 0% or getting to less than 1%. Um, I mean, you're looking at the Stanford Health System, you're looking at a VA medical center, um, Brooks Army Medical Center, um, University of South Carolina, like these are not just 100 bed hospitals in the middle of you know nowhere these are large facilities that are that are able to achieve this so i would tell them that if they can do it we can do it um the other thing is is and this is i i don't like to get into a lot of the money thing but um i was lucky enough at the time that i did my study and magnolia i believe still does it but we had a money back guarantee that we were going to cut our blood cultures in half um so that was another way for me to say well you know what if you don't believe it then let's just give it a try let's give it 90 days um don't ask for the the whole elephant at one time right just eat it in bits and pieces just say to them just give me 30 days give me 60 days give me 90 days to try and if we come out on the end better then we can look at that and if and if we come out on the right then i can say you were right um but i guarantee you that with the team that will come out and help you um, to implement this product um with the education and utilizing these hro principles i would be very surprised if you know six 90 days from now you didn't email me and say yeah we did it yeah. well thank you so much for a really really wonderful presentation i don't know if you want to flip to the end of your deck with your contact oh, yeah. information once more yeah. but just really want to thank you and magnolia for um for, for leading this presentation today. Uh, just a reminder for those uh, still on the line, once we close out this webinar and evaluation will appear, we really value your feedback. So please take a moment and fill that out. Uh, so if you have more questions for Dr. Marola and the team, feel free to reach out to them. Uh, but otherwise, thank you again for joining us, everyone. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much, Jen. Have a good one.